At around 5.30 a.m. on the morning of the 30th of November 1939, Border Guard Miko Kalionba returned from a nighttime patrol to his station at Pielisiarvi, near the town of Lieksa in North Karelia. He had just started sipping a cup of coffee when a report was received that a column of soldiers had been seen crossing the border. Kalionpa returned to base with the news and led out a small contingent to meet intruders. At about 6.30 a.m., Kalionpa made out a figure following the tracks he'd left in the snow, pausing to aim a rifle here and there in the still dark forest. When the figure was within 30 meters, Kalionpa could see the great coat and cap that identified the invader as a Soviet soldier. He took cover behind a tree, watching, and decided if the soldier's aim were to find him, he would have to fire first. Now only 8 meters away, the soldier turned and raised his weapon directly at Kalionpa. Kalionpa pulled the trigger. The soldier dropped his rifle, falling forward into the snow without a sound. This was the first casualty of the conflict that would become to known as the Winter War. Some 20 minutes later, the Soviet Union unleashed attacks by 21 divisions, totaling 450,000 men along Finland's eastern border. Soon after, it began bombing the capital, Helsinki. Finnish newspapers on November 30th headlined Moscow's announcement of a break in diplomatic relations with Finland. But by the time the readers got hands of this newspaper, fierce fighting had already started just 70 kilometers away. On the day the conflict started, Finland had approximately 300,000 men under arms ready to defend the whole of the country. It was woefully short of supplies, with only enough cartridges, shells and fuel to last about two months. The Soviets had secretly built roads leading to the border, allowing them to deploy their 2,514 tanks and 718 armoured cars. Even so, what Soviet military planners thought would be a swift advance on the first day, they made little headway in the face of fierce resistance at the border. The main Soviet attack began at 6.50 a.m. on the 30th of November, with an artillery barrage on the Karelian Isthmus, followed by an all-out attack by land and air. Finnish troops made delaying actions before falling back to prepared defensive lines and carried out scorched earth tactics along the way, destroying anything that could be used to the Soviet forces. The Finns had long planned the strategy of defence in depth on the Karelian Isthmus. Coordinated attacks by large Soviet forces further north along the border came as more of a surprise. Soviet bombers flying out of air bases in Estonia just across the Gulf of Finland carried out the first attack on targets in Helsinki. At 9.20 a.m., Five minutes after the first air raid sirens were heard in the Finnish capital, a formation of three Soviet SB-2 bombers appeared over Helsinki, headed for an attack on Malmi airfield on the city's outskirts. The first bombs fell near an elementary school in Santa Hamina. Because of cloudy conditions, the planes failed to find their target, instead unloading their bombs in residential parts. A second wave of bombers came at around 10.35 a.m. Anti-aircraft gunners downed one plane, causing the rest to break formation and hurriedly drop their bombs loads near Santa Hamina Naval Airfield without damaging the facility. A third wave hit the city between 3 p.m. and 4.20 p.m. These targeted the city's centre, mainly hitting the area between Hietalati and the Campi bus station. But among the buildings bombed was actually the Soviet embassy. Along with renewed bomber attacks the next day, these were the most devastating in terms of life lost of the entire Winter War. Altogether, 91 people were killed and 36 seriously wounded. And in a 1930s case of fake news, Soviet state radio claimed Finnish reports of the air raids were false and the Soviet Air Force had been merely dropping bread to the starving masses in Helsinki. Finnish army reservists were actually called into service as early as October 1939, when negotiations in Moscow were still underway and there was no hope for peace. They were called for so-called extraordinary manoeuvres, which were in fact large-scale training combined with concealed mobilisation. 
A Finnish reservist would come to the army in his civilian clothes, and in some cases the army did not have enough uniforms. So the reservist received only a Finnish white and blue hat emblem and a metal belt buckle with a Finnish line on it. A reservist belonging to the home guard would come to the army assembly point in his home guard uniforms and sometimes with his own weapon. After the assembly and formation of units, reservists were transported to the main defensive lines of the Finnish army. There, Finnish soldiers manned concrete bunkers from early as the 1920s and started preparations for war. In many sectors, there were no fortifications at all, so soldiers were first accommodated in tents. Construction of wooden underground dugouts started immediately and by outbreak of the war, a Finnish soldier often had a heated and relatively safe accommodation underground. In northern areas of Finland where the Finnish leadership did not expect a Soviet attack, defensive preparations remained limited and in some places soldiers had to live in tents that were heated by a stove. During the first phases of the war, the regular activity of Finnish soldiers at the main defensive line was upgrading their fortifications and sending out patrols. When the Red Army approached the Finnish defences, the situation changed radically. During the first Soviet offensive, Finnish soldiers had to spend days repelling attacks of their opponent. During the nights, they had to repair damaged fortifications and obstacles. With the end of the first Soviet offensive, some Finnish sectors remained under daily heavy artillery fire. Soldiers sat in bunkers, nervously waiting for a bunker to be hit. Nights were spent repairing collapsed trenches, bunkers and obstacle lines. Soldiers had to take turns in trenches to make sure the Red Army infantry would not approach their positions unnoticed. Every night a patrol was sent to determine the positions of the opposing Red Army. Food would only arrive at the front when it was dark. During the day, every movement of the Finnish side immediately drew fire from the Red Army artillery. One Finnish veteran recalled that during the day, all movement ceased at the Finnish positions. But during the night, the front line was as lively as a market square. Ammo and food were brought from the rear, wounded were transported to the rear, battle engineers were repairing trenches, Bunkers and obstacle lines and infantrymen had to assist them and patrols were sent to the Soviet lines. And because of this, Finnish units on the Karelian Isthmus were rotated. Even during rest from frontline duty, Finnish soldiers continued to work on building fortifications, strengthening their second line of Finnish defences. Generally speaking, the world's opinion was highly in favour of Finland. Within days of fighting breaking out, people around the world were holding protests outside Soviet embassies. Sweden had the most to lose from a conquered Finland. Eager Swedes created the Committee for Finland on the very first day of the war, with the aim of creating, supporting and persuading the government to allow for a volunteer force to fight in Finland. Norway was also similar in that it allowed its citizens to volunteer to fight in Finland. The Norwegian people were also extremely generous in donating money that could be used to purchase military equipment that Finland desperately needed. The Norwegian government also supplied vital resources such as tin and leather, as well as secretly moving 12 artillery pieces and a few hundred rifles across the border. Norway's biggest support though came in the form of allowing aircraft purchased from the UK and US to land and be shipped into Norway before being moved to either Sweden for assembly or Finland for assignment. A small flight training school was even opened near Oslo so that Finns could receive flight training in fairly safe conditions. In the United Kingdom, France, Canada and the United States, there were several charity events in order to collect money that could be sent to Finland. Over $6 million was collected in the US alone. Indeed, the United States was the first government to officially respond to the Soviet invasion by President Franklin D. Roosevelt making a public speech condemning the actions of the Soviet Union and offering to mediate between the two nations. Former US President Herbert Hoover founded the Finnish Relief Fund, which held gala events as well as other fundraisers throughout the country. The Winter War would last a further three months, one week and six days, with the end result being the Moscow Peace Treaty. And over the next few months and weeks myself on this channel, you're going to see videos based around people and events that happened during the Winter War. 
and about Finland's valiant defence against the Soviet Union. Make sure you press like, leave a comment, and don't forget to press subscribe. Thank you very much.